everybody. So the, the main question I want to ask here is, who would want to know if the device they're running as part of their industrial co control system is not running the genuine firmware that came from the vendor, or that its configuration or its ladder logic has somehow been compromised. Or perhaps it's been, it has given up the secrets which let it interact with the other elements of the industrial control system. And this is what we mean when we're talking about device integrity. The, the goal is to make the integrity of the device a visible and a tangible property, so we can move the point of detection of an attack as close as possible to the point of compromise. And in this way, we, we let our, the operators and the users really know that they can trust the devices that make up their control system. Now, we're going to see that in order to have this property of our devices, we have to defend against both the attacks on the operational side which we're used to think, thinking about. But in addition, the attacks on the supply side, where the device is assembled, where the device is manufactured, and how it gets to the user. And what makes it a, a special challenge is that this is one of the lower layers of protection that we have. It's when this kind of protection has to kick in, often the device has already been hacked. And even in those circumstances, the most we want to accept is that the device can be broken by the attacker. We don't want to accept that the, the attacker can change the behavior of the device. and We don't want to accept that the attacker can somehow steal the secrets. And above all, we do not want the device to become an asset that lets the attacker move deeper into the network and help him achieve some, some secondary or some follow-up objective. So, the history of why we need this, I, I think, is pretty clear. We've, um, many years ago, in the early days of Basecamp, we had an example of a device that got bricked by um, the, the researchers. They were, they were fuzzing industrial control protocols. And one of the devices crashed in a fatal way. And even when they reset it, the device didn't come back up. And we can surmise that the reason is that the um, there was maybe a buffer overflow in one of the security protocols. The random data that was generated by the fuzzer ended up getting executed as code. And somehow in that code, it, it modified something on the flash that resulted in firmware corruption. And then when the device rebooted, it no longer had valid firmware. It couldn't boot. <clears throat> um, we have another example of this in the, in the Ukraine attack where the the SANS analysis tells us that um, one of the steps in the attack was to destroy the firmware, to attack the firmware running on some serial to Ethernet converters so that the operators would be denied control of their process and an ability to, to react. And in this case, they, they attacked the firmware to, to break the device. But with the same capability, they, they could have modified that device because they're controlling the firmware on the flash. And with that, they could have made that device malicious and maybe achieved more, some more destructive effect. We also have the example of the, the vehicle hacking that we saw at the end of 2014, where the researchers were able to inject vehicle control commands through a part of the wireless attack surface. And what was interesting in that example was that there are indications that the vehicle designers thought about security. There was a component that had the responsibility to isolate the vehicle control bus from that wireless attack surface on the, the remote interfaces. But the researchers, as a step in their attack, they were able to inject a firmware update to that component that stripped that security measures from the system so that component no longer isolated the vehicle controls from the wireless attack surface. And what this shows us is that when we do this kind of security measure, we have to take it all the way down to the hardware, because otherwise there will be somebody smart enough who's able to figure out how it works and strip that system of its layers of protection. And really, 
what we're talking about here, it's a, a next logical step after communication robustness. <coughs> in communication robustness, what we accept is that during a denial of service or a fuzzing attack, maybe we can lose uh, connectivity to a device. But once normal conditions return on the network, that device has to be reachable again. And when we talk about device security, we want the same thing. Even if somebody attacks that device, maybe during the attack, there can be a problem to, to reach it. But after the attack, that device has to either return to normal without having given up anything the sensitive, or it has to be broken in a way that an operator knows it has to be replaced. If the device has become malicious, this is not acceptable. The, the standards are mostly aligned with this. The, um, in the use control part of 62443, we talk about the integrity of audit data. In the data integrity part, we have integrity everywhere. As we'd expect, there's integrity of firmware, integrity of configuration, the detection of malicious code. And in data confidentiality, it recognizes the user configuration and the secrets that let it participate in the control system. In addition to the 62443 standard, we have national standards in different countries that they also identify this. Um, in, France, in France, we have ANSI, which publishes protection targets from, for PLCs. And they're explicit about the attacker capabilities in these protection targets. So they note that the, we have to assume the attacker can obtain an equivalent device. So it's not the user's device. It doesn't have the user's secret keys. It doesn't have the user's program. But it's an equivalent device. And with that device, the attacker can spend as much time as he wants to either find zero days or to reverse security updates. And once he's done this, he will have discovered vulnerabilities, maybe only for unpatched systems or maybe zero day vulnerabilities. And it, it's also explicit that we cannot assume the device is deployed in a physically secure way. We know that in some cases it will be, but there are also users who will not have good physical security, so that cannot be part of the mitigation. We have to assume the attacker can physically access the device. Now, the attacker cannot take the device apart to study it in its operational environment. We, if he comes into the operational environment with specialist tools like logic probes, this is not a part of the attacker capability, but because he has physical access, he could steal it and take it back to a lab and do whatever he wants to do there. And it's a special situation that we come back to later. <clears throat> okay. So when we start thinking about how we can defend this, we, we really have to look over the entire device lifecycle. Because there, there's two, two main parts, and we have to think about them in different ways. On the supply side of the device lifecycle, this is where the, the vendor, he's, um, he comes up with the concept, the, he makes choices about the hardware components. He'll, he'll develop firmware, and um, he, he'll assemble it and produce it and put it in a box. And uh, there, there's a set of attacks that can happen here. The very unlikely scenarios, but also high in impact, because if successful, every device rolling off that manufacturing line, maybe it's pre-compromised. Maybe if an attacker is able to substitute trays of components or even like switch a different firmware image in the factory compared to the one that development sent, or perhaps even tamper a manufacturing process so some essential configuration that was needed to enable a security feature didn't happen. So we have to think about these and make sure they, they cannot happen. But we also have a responsibility because we know on the operational side, the user is going to trust that device with sensitive data. So there will be like ladder logic for sure and a configuration that you know, embodies you know, perhaps trade secrets and competitive advantages. But there will also be credentials that let that device interact with the rest of the industrial control system. And these must be kept secret at all costs. <clears throat> and this is what is connecting the two sides of this picture, because 
on the vendor side of the life cycle, on the supply side, we have to build in the hardware security features that will be needed once these sensitive assets are put on the device on the user side of it. <coughs> so when we start talking about the, the technical features that we will use to create a foundation for such a system, one of, the, one of the foundational measures will be signatures. And I know this is repetitive for some people, but I don't want to talk about the theory of signatures and the, how we integrate them to protect our system at the same time. So let's have a quick recap. So on the development side, we're, we're in a secure environment. We have, a, we have a private key. And as we generate the firmware image, we're also going to generate a digest of it, a non-reversible digest that we will sign using the private key. And the, the private key is the important part. This is something that we never put out in the public. Um, then we will package these two things together into a signed firmware image. And this, this is what goes to the factory to go onto the device. Now, on the device side of this, when it's plugged in in the end user environment, the device will turn on. And as part of booting, it's going to verify the signature. So it will recalculate that digest over the firmware that it's got on its flash. <coughs> and it will compare that with the digest in the signature. And then it will, using a public key, it will check that the signature really came from the vendor's private key. And what's key here is the device only has the public key. That's all it needs. It never needs to know the private key. The private key never leaves the secure environment. And in the event that there is a signature mismatch, the device just won't boot. It will be equivalent to a broken device. We can see the, you know, the digest won't be the same. The signature won't validate. It's a broken device. Now, in terms of what happens when a device boots, the, the first place it will start executing is in some read-only code called a bootrom. And th this is very simple, very small code. And it cannot be modified. It cannot be tampered by, by an attacker. The more interesting initialization is in a bootloader. And this will be specific to a product. And because it's specific to a product, it has to be stored on flash. And because it's stored on flash, it is modifiable. And finally, the, the more rich OS, the firmware layer, will get started by the bootloader. So when the attacker comes into this picture, what he's interested in doing is modifying the behavior of the firmware. So he, he will get code execution on the platform, and he will modify that to whatever his objective is to exfiltrate some data or to you know, change the behavior of the device into something malicious. And so in order to stop that, we're going to put a signature on the firmware, which means that before we start the firmware, we have to check the signature, which means that the bootloader has to contain a public key which will validate that signature. And that's great, but there's something missing from this picture. Because now what the attacker is going to do is modify the bootloader. It's still on flash. And in order to get the same level of protection right the way down to the hardware, we've got to put the public key into the boot ROM. And these devices have a special area of read-only memory or one-time programmable memory where we can do this as part of manufacturing. And then we have a complete secure chain. The boot ROM validates the bootloader. And the bootloader validates the firmware. <coughs> and of course, as part of manufacturing, we have to have some negative testing for this. Because otherwise, all the valid images will, will boot. But if we don't test it negatively, we don't know that the non-valid images don't boot. And, and this is something that's standard in consumer electronics for a significant time now. But it's not this simple, because our development organization needs a way to sign that firmware. And signing firmware is actually really simple to do in a really bad way. Because if you Google this, you will, you will be able to download software. And in five minutes, you will be up and running. And you will have generated signatures. Um, <clears throat> But what you will have done is you will have a private key that, that's held in a software key container. And human stuff will happen to that software key container. It will get put on a USB key and left in somebody's car. Uh, 
it will get emailed to somebody and included on a mail server backup. Maybe the person who generated it leaves the company and takes it with him. All sorts of bad things can happen. But worst of these things is that you can never know what that key has signed or how many copies are out there. Because if it's in software, you don't have any strong control over what that key does and where it goes. So to do this properly, you've got to have a HSM from a reputable vendor, and you've got to store it in a secure location, and you've got to restrict the people who can access that location, and you've got to authorize the, the production release images of those firmware, firmware images. <coughs> And maybe if you have a mission, a possible scenario, somebody like Ethan Hunt can come through the air duct vent or something like that. It's extremely, extremely unlikely. But even in this worst case scenario, you will have visibility that that has happened because the HSM will also protect its audit logs. <coughs> now, does this stop somebody we saw yesterday with a focused ion beam? It doesn't, but it does stop it becoming a class attack. You have to break every device individually. And you can't do that on an operating device, and we trust our users to notice if one of their devices gets stolen. Now, th th this is a start. We now have some control over the code which will run on the device. So we, we've made this code trustworthy. But it doesn't answer the question which we saw, which is also we have to protect the user data. And the user data belongs to the user, so we can't chain it back directly to a root of trust that belongs in you know, a vendor factory. So what we have to do is, well, first recognize what are these user assets we have to protect. So the things like private keys for communication, ladder logic. These, in the past, it's the sort of thing that we might have looked to obfuscation to do. Like maybe we had a hidden directory. Maybe we had some other tricks that, are, that we used. Um, but we want something more than this now. So what we want is trust boundaries within the device. So we know that the main firmware, it's very large body of code, complex interactions, many libraries, a large attack surface. And we can apply the SDL very seriously, and we will, we will be very attentive to threat modeling and to secure coding and to security testing. We, we will do a great job and all that stuff. But there can still be scenarios where something slips through because you have the Apples and the Microsofts, the Googles. They still have some security bugs. So we cannot rule that out. What we need is another layer of protection. <coughs> um, <coughs> so what we want is some. CPU enforcement, some hardware enforcement of this trust boundary. So even an attacker who can get code executing in the main firmware through his buffer overflow, he's not able to read the assets that we're maintaining behind this trust boundary. And modern CPU architectures provide this. We're, we're familiar with user mode and kernel mode from operating system design. We, we now have a mode which is above kernel mode. In Intel, it's uh, trusted execution. In ARM, it's trust zone. And we can create resources which are only accessible to code which is um, running in this high privilege mode. And we make this code as small as possible so the attack surface is reduced, it's very well reviewed, it's very well tested, and there is no way to pull that sensitive data out behind that trust boundary. <coughs> so is this going to stop the, the hardware attacker? Um, he can still see the device and with special equipment and a lot of time, it may be possible for him to do this. But what we don't have here is we don't have global keys. We're using standard cryptographic algorithms and device unique keys. So even if a hardware hacker can't succeed to break this, he breaks it for one single device. And that was stolen from the user environment, and we trust the user to recognize it's stolen. And he has time to revoke the credentials so they cannot be used in a further attack on his operating system, on his control system. So what's the takeaway from this? <clears throat> we, we haven't covered all of the attack scenarios. And this is a foundation for you know, more sophisticated security use cases that can be more interesting. But it is the basic foundation that lets us 
know the code which is running on the device and give a layer of protection to the sensitive data which is stored on the device. And it comes from two security features that are they're well analyzed, they're mature, they're in use in consumer electronics for a number of years now. And of course, the context of industrial devices is different than consumer devices, but some of these problems are cross-cutting, and some of the solutions can be adapted to fit in our context. And in the end, these features make the device much harder to compromise and much harder for an attacker to achieve his objective. But the main takeaway is that the security has to go all the way down to the hardware. Because if we're doing things in software layers and in firmware layers, there will be somebody smart enough who can strip through that layer of protection and break your security architecture and perhaps even turn it into a class attack. So we have to, in the, in the earliest stages of hardware design, to factor these needs in so that we can source components that have the right hardware security features so we can deliver this, this, uh, the, on these security requirements to the users. And in that way, the devices can be resistant to these types of attack. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much.